and uh, so I'm uh, I'm mostly I have been uh, in the universities uh, starting from Busan National University in 1989 and then moved to Seoul National University in uh, 1998. Uh, but uh, uh, in early last year, I was asked to lead the this institute called CASI. It's a it stands for Korea Astronomy and Space Science Institute. And uh, so I'd like to uh, take a few minutes to introduce this institute because it's not, uh, you may not uh, know this institute very well. Uh, this is a stands, uh, as I said, stands for uh, this. And it was founded in 1974 as the National Astronomical Observatory. But really, it was inherited from Royal Observatory that lasted for more than 1,000 years uh, without interruption. Although the, the dynasty has changed, uh, the National Observatory has the same name and has the same organization uh, until 1910. And, uh, and in 1910, uh, what Japanese did first was to demolish this kind of organization because it's a, it's a symbol of the country, independent country. And um, so we have a very uh, rough history after that for many years. And uh, so the even liberation in 1945, uh, we didn't have the, this system and it was uh, reestablished in 1974 uh, after we had some reasonable economic power. And this was a national observatory, but turned into government-funded institute in 1985 because uh, this uh, organization is not a research institute. Actually, it's a, it's a kind of timekeeping and, and some kind of things that is necessary for the country. But uh, as a government-funded institute for research, uh, we have this traditional role of uh, providing facilities to astronomical and space science communities well, space science was added actually in this time because it's traditionally just astronomy, but uh, this was added and uh, so the uh, providing is, uh, facilities and also research was emphasized. And we have additional role uh, added afterwards, which is space situation awareness, which means that we have to follow the all the uh, debris in the sky, etc. And uh, we have uh, several observational facilities within Korea. And uh, we have two optical observatories, one here and the other here. And uh, these are uh, th these two. Th this is a very small telescope, 60 centimeter. This has a 1.8 meter telescope. Uh, but this is uh, very important for us because it was first uh, the modern telescope uh, dedicated for the research. And we have a network of three radio telescopes that composes a, a Korean VLBI network. Uh, this is a VLBI system for millimeter wavelengths. And we have also a single dish uh, radio observatory located in the headquarters of uh, the institute in Daejeon. And uh, in order to do the space awareness obligation, we uh, are running a uh, laser ranging system as well. We also have many facilities abroad. Uh, the most notable things are the uh, KMT net. This is uh, identical three telescopes located in South Africa, Australia, and Chile in order to cover the southern sky for 24 hours a day. And main, uh, the name itself means that the microlensing network. So it covers the, uh, the bulge uh, of the sky uh, bulge of the of the galaxy uh, for 24 hours during uh, half of the year when it's uh, clearly visible, and uh, we can do also other transient kind of sciences with this telescope. And uh, these are small telescopes to monitor the sky, uh, the moving object, and we are running uh, JCMT together with uh, uh, with uh, Japan. Uh, China and Taiwan, and uh, we are partner of the GMT. Actually, Korea, Kasi is the founding partner of the GMT project, and we have some telescope also located in, in Arizona. <coughs> uh, 
this is just a very brief introduction of KMTNet. As I said, it's uh, three identical telescopes of uh, 1.6 diameter and large field of view. Uh, actually, the camera is located in prime focus and uh, purpose is to 24 hours uninterrupted monitoring of the night sky in si southern hemisphere. And so this, this is one of the science highlight that the, uh, the one of the microlensing uh, discovered was observed together with the speecher so that we have the, the parallax and uh, in that way we can break the uh, distance and mass degeneracy uh, to measure the mass of the planet uh, very accurately. And this is the monitoring of the uh, monitoring of the uh, EM follow-up observation of the gravitational wave event. And these are very dense, densely uh, sampled photometric data, which is quite unique. Uh, although a lot of telescopes uh, were dedicated to, to observe the, uh, the gravitational wave event due to the neutron star merger in 2017. And uh, the BLBI network uh, I just mentioned is composed of three telescopes, uh, but it's a part of the, we are now expanding the, uh, the network into East Asian BLBI network together with Japan and China. And there are about 20 telescopes uh, within this whole network. So some fraction of time is dedicated for the our system alone, but uh, then we have uh, uh, extended network together with Japan, and some fraction of time is now dedicated for the station BLBI network. So the baseline now uh, covers uh, several thousand kilometers, and also it has been uh, used for the calibration of the EHD observations because uh, EHD observation was done only for twenty. 230 gigahertz, they needed uh, the uh, spectral energy distribution. And uh, our network, uh, together with the East Asian BLBI network, was used for, the, uh, for that kind of purposes. And uh, Kashi also has uh, several uh, small space uh, programs. Started in 2003 uh, for far ultraviolet imaging spectrograph. Uh, this is the old sky survey done by this project. It's a, a joint project with the, uh, with the Berkeley and the, uh, in US it's called in a different name, Spears. Uh, and uh, in 2013, uh, we launched a small, again, small near infrared uh, telescope uh, that covered also the uh, entire galactic plane. And uh, uh, it has a narrow band filter in Passion Alpha and discovered many new H alpha, uh, I mean H2 regions, et cetera. And most recently, there is a near infrared spectroscopic surveyor, uh, which was launched last year and uh, produced the, the uh, near infrared spectroscopic imaging uh, of the systems. This is comparison between HST and uh, our image. Of course, the resolution is very bad, but spectral coverage is quite large with the uh, low resolution spectroscopy. And this NISS, because of the NISS, we became part of the uh, SphereX mission, which is a new explorer mission of NASA announced uh, last February this year. And it will be launched in 2023. And this will be the first all sky near infrared spectral, spectral survey uh, and uh, to do the uh, science like a uh, large scale structure of the universe and also the uh, star forming regions, etc. Actually, Robert Lofton was one of the uh, selection committee members, and I <laughs> appreciate it. <laughs> okay, so let's go into my talk. So, the plan is I'll cover, try to cover uh, three subjects. Uh, w starting from dynamical formation of black hole binaries and their properties uh, in the star clusters. And uh, also, there may be interesting things we can do with the parabolic and hyperbolic encounters because they are uh, able to produce uh, the burst like signals. And although the, these signals are weak, maybe we'll be, we'll be able to 
uh, detect these signals in the future, and that also tells us about the uh, about the uh, clusters containing black holes, uh, etc., which cannot be easily observed by the uh, electromagnetic waves. And I probably don't have time to go through this part, uh, but maybe I can show a couple of slides on this subject and summarize. That's the plan. I saw the, from the list of the speakers uh, this semester, there are already two uh, talks on gravitational waves. Uh, one was by Rana Adhikari, who uh, was an instrumentalist, and uh, I think he probably have sh given you the uh, future of the gravitational wave detectors. And another was uh, uh, Pat, uh, Patrick Brady, who is a current spokesperson of the LIGO, and I think he has given a very broad overview of the LIGO project and current status, etc. So I, uh, I don't think I need to introduce uh, LIGO and, and this kind of thing. Uh, but I, I would like to start with the very simple, uh, simple uh, facts about the gravitational waves coming from the uh, from the binary system. So essentially, the frequency of the gravitational wave is of twice of the frequency of the, of the orbital motion, uh, just because the radiation is quadrupolar. And uh, because of the gravitational wave emission, there is a secular changes in both um, semi-major axis and eccentricity. And uh, what it means is that the, uh, due to the gravitational waves, even if you start with very eccentric binary, they, uh, the, uh, first of all, the uh, the semi-major axis uh, gradually uh, reduces to a small value uh, as well as the eccentricity itself. So the, uh, there is a circularization process. And uh, if we just concentrate on the circular binaries, uh, the uh, duration of the, uh, of the gravitational wave emitting phase at fixed frequency is uh, typically uh, in very sensitive function of the frequency itself. So at, it stays very long for uh, at low frequencies and the uh, passes through the high frequency phase very rapidly. And at the end, uh, everything happens within a fraction of a second. And we often use this uh, as a very important number uh, as called a symmetric mass ratio. And the, uh, also you know, assume that the merger takes place uh, roughly speaking, at the enormous stable circular orbit, and this can be expressed in this way, where the mass is the total mass of the of the binary system. So this we would be kind of a highest mass you expect from the uh, binary system. And uh, so the, there could be um, many. So a gravitational wave. Frequency covers a large range, and uh, these are uh, the just the uh, uh, names we use to characterize the uh, gravitational wave de detectors. So for the high frequency, it's uh, mostly ground-based detectors, ranging from 30 to uh, 30 hertz to kilohertz, and they are coming from uh, stellar mass black holes and neutron stars. And there is uh, also neutron new low frequency. Uh, detection possibility uh, b using the uh, detector, the plan, plan detector in space, uh, laser interferometer space antenna uh, that ranges from 0.1 millihertz to 0.1 hertz, and the uh, suitable sources for this uh, for this detector is white dwarf binaries or massive black holes. Now it's not super massive black holes because. Uh, as you can see, actually, the mass is uh, smaller than 10 to 6 solar mass. And there, uh, one in important thing is that the, uh, this we don't expect the binaries of the similar mass black holes in this range. So probably many sources with the extreme mass ratio inspired, which means that the, uh, there is a supermassive black hole in the center and the stellar mass black holes uh, orbiting around and you uh, and emitting gravitational waves. So th this extreme mass ratio means uh, mass ratio is greater than something like uh, 10 to 4, 10 to 5, or something like that. 
And, and the pulsar timing array, they are aiming for nanohertz. And uh, this is uh, even lower frequency than LISA. And this is really uh, supermassive black holes. But this is not the real direct detection, but uh, detection uh, by using the, uh, the modulation of pulsar signals. And uh, recently, people uh, have been discussing the mid frequency detector. Uh, I, I'll show the uh, frequency uh, versus uh, sensitivity diagram. But thi there is a gap between these frequency ranges, so uh, which is about 0.1 to 1 hertz. And this is also a very interesting uh, frequency range, although the it's, it's not easy to realize the detector. Uh, operating at these uh, frequencies. And uh, the target of this uh, frequency range is uh, intermediate mass black holes. Again, uh, probably you don't expect too many uh, binary black holes uh, composed of black holes of this mass. Uh, but maybe a smaller mass black hole is uh, orbiting around. And in this case, it's called intermediate mass ratio in, in spiral. And this uh, different between extreme mass ratio and intermediate mass ratio in spiral is just, uh, uh, just, uh, just convenience, but uh, the computationally they are quite, uh, quite difficult uh, to, to do, uh, to, uh, to make the waveforms. And uh, you may have to use different uh, methodologies between extreme mass ratio and intermediate mass ratio. So this is, uh, very big diagram, but essentially it covers uh, frequency ranges uh, from nanohertz to uh, uh, kilohertz. And uh, so this is typical uh, ground-based laser interferometer detector. So we can see that uh, this target uh, stellar mass black holes or neutron star, uh, neutron star <coughs> within a gigaparsec range. And this is LISA, and they just uh, put E in front of uh, LISA recently because they have to, uh, I think, descope the, the LISA a little bit. Uh, so as I said, there is a gap between uh, ELISA and advanced LIGO. And this is the uh, pulsar timing array. So depending on the frequency ranges, you expect different types of uh, binaries. And this MBHB means massive black hole binary. And this is a, again massive black hole binary, but the mass is much larger here. <coughs> now, uh, quickly uh, summarizing the uh, LIGO detection, we have uh, 10, I think it's a 10. Yeah, 10 uh, black hole binaries. And these are the masses and the, uh, the final masses final spin, et cetera, and then there is a, a mass ratio. And uh, so if I just want to summarize, it's uh, my, uh, uh, my personal view, but uh, current ground-based detectors are sensitive, um, I mean, 10 solar mass black holes, but the, uh, they are usually uh, much larger than uh, 10 solar mass. And the mass ratios are mostly within uh, one to two. So considering the uncertainties, I think this, you can regard this as a relatively, uh, the masses are comparable. And the, this is again, uh, my own compilation of the, this uh, uh, masses of the binaries. So, but uh, X-ray binaries are typically within uh, 10 solar mass and gravitational wave detection gave uh, masses. Uh, they, they are masses within this range, but uh, Many of them are much higher than uh, what is observed with, uh, by X-ray binaries. So we are still uh, waiting for, for more data. Actually, O3 run. I'm not sure Patrick has uh, introduced any results of the O3. We are not supposed to uh, talk about the <laughs> results of the current observing run. Uh, but. Uh, I think the, this kind of trend will continue. <laughs> well, just uh, one, one important thing is that the, the observational bias, that the low mass black holes produce uh, 
uh, small uh, weak weak signals. So we tend to uh, find more massive black holes. Now uh, the the implications of the uh, very small number of detections, 10 is, uh, it was more than what we expected, but it's still very small number. And probably we will have uh, many more uh, events at the end of this year, uh, because uh, the O3 run will end by the end of this year. We, uh, what we found was the black hole binary coalescence appears to be much more frequent than uh, previously thought. And uh, uh, I'll talk about this, I'll, I'll uh, 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 emphasize this a little bit in, in further. But uh, current estimated estimation of the rate is uh, 100, between 110 to so almost 4,000 per year. Per, uh, this must be cubic gigaparsec, not uh, per gigaparsec. This is uh, the summary of, of the uh, two observing runs appeared in PRX last year. And uh, so these binaries uh, may have formed by through the evolution of binary stars composed of uh, high mass stars. And um, there are people who uh, are proposing that they may have been formed dynamically in the dense stellar uh, systems. And that's exactly the reason why I became involved in the, in the gravitational waves. Uh, because many years ago, I was invited to a gravitational wave symposium. And I didn't know uh, about the gravitational waves at that time, except that the, I have written a paper on the, uh, on the uh, black hole binaries. And then I was, uh, I thought that this is a really interesting uh, subject. So I, uh, I joined the LIGO scientific collaboration. <coughs> so uh, let me talk about dynamical formation processes. So uh, this, this has been uh, already known for a long time. Some of them uh, appeared in my uh, PhD thesis. And uh, Jeremy was one of the pioneers of the, this kind of uh, processes. And of course, gravitational wave can be, uh, I mean, the uh, black hole binaries can be uh, formed by either direct capture, because uh, when two black holes approach each other to uh, small distances, they pro generate, uh, irradiate gravitational waves, and that's uh, dissipation of the orbital energy. And if the amount of dissipation is sufficiently large, you uh, end up with the bound system. That's called a gravitational wave capture. Uh, the, uh, in fact, they are, must be in parabolic, or, uh, must be in hyperbolic orbit, but it's easier to do the calculation in parabolic orbit. So <coughs> in the parabolic approximation, you can easily calculate the capture cross-section, and that translates into the uh, capture rate per volume, capture rate uh, per volume. And three-body processes means that the, uh, in dense stellar systems, you ha have uh, occasionally three stars get together at the same, near the same volume, and then after some interaction, one star get ejected and the, the other star remain bound. That's uh, not dissipational process, but because of the three body systems, you make uh, uh, two stars unbound by taking some energy uh, uh, by, the, by the third star. Now the question is, which one is more efficient? So you just uh, take the ratio, and it turned out it depends on the density and uh, velocity dispersion. And as you can see, that uh, it's only inversely proportional to the number density, <coughs> but it's very sensitive to the velocity dispersion. Of course, you might say that the density varies a lot compared to the velocity dispersion. But still, uh, this is uh, uh, more than seven. And even just one order of magnitude change of this number makes us more than five orders of magnitude uh, difference. So, um, so in globular clusters where the velocity dispersion is around 10 kilometers per second or even smaller, uh, and then three-body processes are more efficient. 
and in the galaxy nuclei, uh, the velocity dispersion is order of 100 kilometers per second, and in the reasonable uh, density, uh, the uh, two-body process will be uh, more efficient. So this is a very simple uh, dichotomy. And uh, then what's going to happen? Well, first of all, in order to uh, do the study the dynamical, uh, study the binary evolution, you actually have to take into account the dynamical evolution of the global cluster system because uh, global clusters are not static system. And uh, especially in, in the core, uh, the density changes a lot during the evolution through the, um, through the, uh, the core collapse and or dynamical friction, et cetera. So uh, you have to take into account uh, this kind of uh, processes, uh, relaxation and uh, mass segregation, et cetera. And the, uh, then we can characterize the orbits of the bi uh, dynamical binaries. First of all, the captured binaries, they are very eccentric uh, when they are formed. So eccentricity can be measured by this 1 minus e, uh, which is very small number, which means that the eccentricity is 0 0.99 or 999 or something like that. And uh, semi-major axis uh, is relatively small. You can characterize in this way, although it depends a lot on the, on the eccentricity. On the other hand, three-body binaries, uh, the eccentricity is uh, uh, moderate, so we call it uh, thermal distribution. It's, uh, we have more weight toward the high eccentricity, but it's very moderate. And a semi-major axis uh, is even larger for uh, such systems. And uh, in particular, considering the difference of the uh, velocity dispersion in, in nu galactic nuclei and star clusters, you see that the uh, this will be much larger than in, in this case. And uh, the, the merging time, merging time means after the formation of the binary, you ask how long it will take the, this binary will merge. And uh, because of these facts, actually these uh, binaries formed in the global clusters have extremely long merging time. So you don't expect they, they, they will merge within Hubble time. Gravitational waves, yes. Uh, uh, gravitational waves. Yeah. 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 That's right. So, so actually, it has a wide range. I, uh, 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 was still, yeah, that's that's right. Yeah, maybe it's a uh, more interesting number here is the pericenter distance. Yeah, yeah, that that has a very narrow range. Yeah, but by assuming uh, assuming Maxwellian velocity distribution, actually you can calculate the. Uh, distribution of semi-major axis, you can see that the, the, the range is quite large, uh, several orders of magnitude. And the eccentricity, uh, although the range is large, this is 1 minus E. So it means that they are all uh, highly eccentric. And merging time range, uh, also large. But uh, the, this is just in, term, in units of second. So some of them merge within uh, minutes. And th but there is a long tail that the may take a uh, thousand years and even million years. And as uh, Robert has pointed out, actually these binaries uh, interact with other stars as well. So the uh, although these three-body binaries are hopeless uh, in terms of the merging time at at, at the formation. Actually, they become tighter and tighter, and uh, and eventually, the, these binaries can get ejected from the cluster because when the binaries become very tight, uh, they interact with the uh, surrounding stars, and always they uh, they 
uh, become more become more tightly bound, and uh, the uh, the remaining energy goes to both of the uh, binaries and uh, and the interacting stars. So there is kind of a, a kick, and if the kick is sufficiently large, then they, they get ejected, and so the, this is the very rough estimation of the critical uh, semi-major axis uh, for the ejection. So if the semi-major axis becomes smaller than this number, and uh, this, this is much, much smaller than what uh, shown in the previous slide. So the, uh, this is how we calculate the, uh, the evolution of binary. So we use the, this dimensionless number, which is called hardness. And again, this I think notion was invented uh, somewhere here. Uh, and uh, this is the ratio between the uh, binding energy and of the binary and the typical kinetic energy of the of the stars, surrounding stars. Now, here I actually the uh, because there is a big difference between in the mass between the uh, surrounding stars and the, the black holes. I just use the uh, different uh, masses for the black hole binaries and the surrounding stars. So this is uh, the background stars and these are the masses of individual uh, black holes. And the condition for the ejection uh, corresponds to uh, about this number and uh, velocity dispersion. I mean this is escape velocity divided by uh, velocity dispersion. And this is the measure of the depth of the potential in the center. Uh, in terms of the uh, typical velocity dispersion. And it, it does not vary much, uh, uh, although the, the, uh, the stellar distribution uh, changes a lot. So I just use this typical number. And then critical uh, hardness before ejection uh, can be expressed like this. And depending on the, the, this ratio, this could be large or small. And, uh, this is shown in this uh, uh, schematic diagram. You can characterize the, uh, the binaries in by these two numbers, eccentricity and hardness. And this is the uh, place where the binaries are formed. They, they are formed at hardness of around a Q. And then, uh, because of the interaction, uh, they, they wander around in this space. Uh, you know, uh, randomly in this direction, but uh, usually upward. And these are the lines uh, of the critical hardness for the ejection. And uh, depending on the velocity dispersion, and this line uh, are different. And uh, these horizontal lines are the uh, critical hardness for, I mean, uh, this is critical hardness for ejection. When this binary touch this line, uh, okay, this is the line where the merging time is comparable to the Hubble time. And this is the line for the ejection. So these lines depends on the velocity dispersion uh, sensitively, but th these lines don't depend on the velocity dispersion because it's just a single number. Uh, but I have drawn many different lines because uh, depending on the what kind of binaries you are considering. This is the binary composed of the uh, same mass with the background stars. But if the, the binaries uh, have a higher mass, then uh, you have a higher number. And uh, this is a critical hardness for, uh, for the, uh, this is for the, uh, neutron star binaries, and this uh, red line is black hole binaries. And assuming that there's about factor of Q difference between uh, background stars and neutron star mass, and factor of uh, uh, 10 or 20 difference in uh, between background stars and black holes. So these are the uh, very uh, the schematic diagram. and. Actually, this is the result of the uh, n-body simulation. We just followed. Uh, it's not a, bit, a terribly large n-body system, but uh, with small uh, n-body systems, you can actually see this kind of behavior. This is the uh, trajectory of the black hole 
uh, in this space, eccentricity and hardness, and you see that they wander and vertically. It's as nice as uh, the, in the figure I have uh, shown, but uh, they, they uh, wander around anyway. And this is the place where they, this is actually get ejected. And with I saw that uh, the, the binaries are actually getting ejected. This is one particular example where we can take the uh, many samples of this kind of behavior uh, from the uh, n-body simulation. And uh, so from now on, I want to show you some statistical results we have obtained. And uh, so this, these are the uh, These are the, uh, the hardness and the uh, ejected binaries. And so these are black hole, black hole binaries. They get ejected at much higher hardness. And neutron star binaries are ejected at smaller hardness. Uh, I have shown sharp lines, but uh, actually it's a, it has a broad distribution, uh, which means that some of them get ejected. And uh, at that, that time of the ejection, they have a a big change in the orbital radius, and therefore uh, they have a large hardness at this end. And uh, this is the, uh, the velocity uh, at the time of the ejection in, in units of escape velocity. Of course, by definition, they have to be greater than uh, escape velocity. And uh, they also, there is a range uh, of, uh, of uh, this ratio. So the most of them are very close to the uh, escape velocity, but there is a long tail uh, of uh, velocity greater than escape velocity. And that uh, can be used to trace where you can find these binaries after get ejected. And then, uh, so I, I just followed until the ejection because uh, until the time of ejection, they are still, their, their orbit is sufficiently wide that the uh, the uh, merger wouldn't take place within the cluster. So the, uh, we have to follow, we have to look, look up the uh, orbital, uh, orbital uh, semi-major axis and eccentricity to calculate the time of merger. And it found that the, the fraction of those binaries which has sufficiently small uh, merging time scale is, is not uh, very large. Um, so this is uh, shown as uh, a function of uh, a velocity dispersion in the center. And for the clusters, for example, uh, five kilometers per second, you have a very small fraction of uh, binaries that you expect to merge uh, after get ejected. But if the velocity be dispersion becomes large, the fraction becomes large. Uh, I don't think we have many clusters with uh, this large velocity dispersion. But typically, uh, less than half, less than half of the uh, binaries will be uh, will end up with the with the mergers. That's a bit different for neutron stars and neutron star. This is a neutron star binary and black hole binary, etc. So it, you can do uh, for neutron stars and black holes. And uh, based on these uh, simulations, we make a very rough estimate about the uh, merger rate uh, in 2014 before the uh, detection of gravitational waves because it's better to make a uh, prediction before the uh, experiment. <laughs> and uh, there are many assumptions, but uh, let me just uh, summarize what we found that the actually we can find maybe around 10 uh, black hole black hole mergers within cubic gigaparsec per year. And I thought that this is pretty large number at that time because uh, in the LIGO, they didn't expect the uh, too many black hole, black hole binary merger uh, until the detection of the uh, gravitational waves. So uh, it's very uncertain, but I didn't want to give too much range. Uh, so the, I just uh, gave uh, kind of order of magnitude range uh, between 1 and 10 or something like that. Uh, but it could be higher 
I mentioned the Kaya, if uh, cluster, many clusters have been already destroyed, because we uh, made this kind of estimation based on the uh, current number of uh, globular clusters and the parameters. And maybe there have been a destruction of global clusters already, and they have uh, produced uh, black hole binaries, and they are wandering around the halo, uh, et cetera. Also, there is a big uncertainty about the uh, number density of globular clusters. And uh, we, we know how many globular clusters in our galaxy and M31, et cetera, very well. But uh, there may be much larger number of uh, global clusters in elliptical galaxies, and et cetera. Uh, this is the black hole, black hole binary. Uh, rate uh, by the by the LIGO group estimation was between actually this is not the uh, made by uh, this prediction was made by the LIGO group but it's just they collected the literature and put the number so that's why the, there is a huge range between 0.1 to 300 and uh, 300 is certainly a very big stretch uh, and uh, so realistic number was close to this number. And um, I thought that this is interesting because this is on top of this number. This is uh, just based on the uh, population synthesis and evolution theories, et cetera. And they didn't take into account uh, the, binary, the uh, dynamical formation. So uh, my claim was that the uh, it may not be dominated by the bi dynamical processes, but it could uh, add significant number to the, uh, to the w w ones what you expect from the stellar evolution. And uh, I tried to convey this message in uh, of several occasions, especially to the LIGO uh, leadership, and they were very pessimistic <laughs> about, about uh, my prediction, but uh, but I think I, you do not remember the number. But the current estimation in this unit is between 110 and 4,000. So already, uh, these numbers are obsolete to some extent. Uh, so we are probably missing something. So. Then after the detection, we uh, wanted to study the properties of these binaries and see if we can delineate between uh, the binaries, dynamical binaries and stellar mass, uh, stellar evolution binaries. Uh, so we ran the multi-mass models because we found already found that the, the masses are higher. So uh, two masses, and then uh, we found that the it's, it's very obvious result because uh, we already knew that we didn't just want to uh, go into these multi-mass models before the detection. But uh, what is found was that the, if you have uh, 10 solar mass and 20 solar mass, uh, just two components, then the, you begin to form the binaries of 20 solar mass first and they get ejected and then 10 solar mass follows and then they get ejected later. And and so on. That's what uh, this graph says. And also, uh, you may wonder how long will it take uh, for these binaries uh, to get ejected from the formation. So this, uh, this is the delta t, the, the difference between the formation and the ejection time. Uh, so delta t, most of the binaries, they are within a couple of uh, uh, relaxation time. But this is not a good uh, unit to, to measure this kind of process. So this, uh, actually, th this you may have to measure in terms of the, uh, the dynamical time scales in r instead of uh, relaxation time. So this diagram shows that if you actually run uh, 25,000 uh, star system and 5,000, actually the 5,000 has a s smaller value on this. So uh, the, the point is that maybe it's, it's a really short time uh, 
gap between the formation and the ejection. But we also found uh, some uh, long-lived binaries. Long-lived binaries means that the uh, delta T over T RH is very large. So this, these are the lines where you expect that they get ejected. But these binaries still are alive in, inside the cluster. And uh, if you actually look at the uh, hardness distribution carefully, you see this, this is a long tail. And it turned out that the, these are the binaries that are formed very late when the uh, density is relatively low and they have very, very small chance of, chance of the uh, interaction and they interact, uh, they experience many, many distant encounters. And so the, uh, the, uh, the kick velocity they get by typical interaction is always very small. And that's how they, they live longer. And maybe uh, some of them uh, can merge inside the cluster, although they are not the majority. Yeah. Uh, no, still, still, we, we don't include. Well, these, these are not uh, really very eccentric systems, and the uh, periaps is still, still pretty large. But if you include th these things, they may accelerate. Okay, well, yeah. Well, I don't know. Actually, still, the, the periaps is uh, quite large, and you expect very small, uh, small periaps shift. But I, I, I haven't actually taken this. Some people say that the uh, post Newtonian is important. Yeah, if it's very close to one. Yeah. Also, the efficiency of the formation of binaries uh, in term with the mass. Uh, this is the simulation uh, using the continuous mass function of the black hole. Uh, although I say it's continuous, actually the, the black hole mass function uh, given by these people have very, very strange features. Uh, but anyway, this is the only thing we can use. Uh, and he was also co-author of this paper. So uh, we uh, used his uh, result. Uh, and the important thing is that the efficiency of the f formation of binary is actually a very sensitive function of the mass. And for the higher mass, you have uh, efficiency almost 50%, but the low mass efficiency is uh, relatively low. Just because uh, uh, the, the you, uh, because dynamical friction takes place for the a high mass components and they form binaries very efficiently and then the next phase is become less and less efficient. So there is a, this kind of trend in terms of the mass and therefore uh, you may explain why you have high mass black holes uh, but again that's uh, based on uh, very simple assumptions. And this is uh, the, uh, the mass ratio between two, two components. And I said earlier that the, in the observed binary systems, the mass ratios are close to one. And that's exactly what we found from the, uh, from the simulation. Uh, because the, uh, the most, one of the most important ingredients is the dynamical friction and the mass aggregation. So the, uh, in the early phase, the central part is the most dominated by the most important, most uh, highest mass component, and they form binaries and get ejected. And next, uh, higher mass uh, goes in, etc. So that that's something what you expect. But this is uh, very sharply picked at around one. And if you actually use the uh, look at the uh, numbers, observed numbers, 
they are more broad. I, I didn't try to make a diagram, a histogram here because only 10, uh, 10 sample. Uh, but if you make a diagram, it will be much broader. Uh, but given uncertainties, I don't think uh, you can really make a direct comparison. Yeah, that's that's right. Yeah. Of course, select. There's a clearly selection effect. Yeah. The but the first one is very loud one, and that could have been detected even with a relatively small mass. <coughs> okay, so, uh, I used up much of my time already, so I quickly go through the uh, hyperbolic encounters. Uh, as I said, the high velocity system, I mean high uh, velocity dispersion system, two body encounters are more interesting. And they, they lead to the direct capture and uh, captured binary produces many burst-like signals and eventually merge into a single black hole. So one of the important features here is that the, uh, this may be a rare event as well. But once this kind of capture happens, they produce, uh, they repeatedly produce the signals for many, many times. And uh, if you multiply by this number, you can, the rate uh, could become much larger. That's one of the important things. So it's a repeated burst. And the, uh, the orbital motion of gravitational wave emission can be obtained by solving uh, two body motions. Now I'm emphasizing these difficulties uh, here compared to, to, to the uh, circular binaries because circular binaries, uh, everything can be easily done uh, by using the 2.5 pn uh, post Newtonian and up to, up to very close distances. But this is a, uh, this is an interaction uh, which varies uh, where the, the distance varies a lot. And it's not easy to do the calculation with uh, uh, full GR. Uh, so uh, it has been uh, studied with the numerical relativity. But of course, there are some uh, other ways to, to approach, which one of them is uh, post-Newtonian, and you add uh, orders of post-Newtonian uh, higher and higher. Then the expressions are extremely complicated. And uh, so one of the things we have done is that the, uh, we actually did numerical simulation. This, the motivation was to, uh, to see how uh, the cross-sections we use using this uh, uh, parabolic approximation and the post-Newtonian formula, et cetera, is valid. Of course, uh, you don't expect too much deviation for most of the systems until 1,000 kilometers per second when uh, you have to be careful about the orbit. And between these, these velocity ranges, actually you don't, or still you don't really have to do the numerical calculations, but you have to be a bit careful about the orbit, but post uh shift and also shrink of the orbit. Then you, you can get a reasonably good uh, cross-section. So this is, uh, uh, this is numerical simulation. But w another, another very Im interesting feature of this feature, uh, this kind of encounter is the obtaining the uh, waveforms. And uh, to get the accurate waveforms, uh, you have to uh, rely on the, on the numerical simulations or better scheme. And the recently, uh, my student, was working on the Keplerian parameterization of the orbits. And this means that the, instead of integrating differential equation with PN order, which I said that the, there are a huge number of terms, and uh, these people found that uh, one PN accurate Keplerian type parametric solution to the compact binaries can be obtained. And that, uh, that means that the, uh, there is no dissipation effect up to one PN. So you just uh, still, it's a conservative motion, uh, but you, you can characterize the orbit in a very simple way. 
And such solutions allow us to compute orbit and even waveforms analytically without interacting PN expanded equational motion. Then you, if you begin to, working on, uh, to work on the waveforms, you have to worry about the dissipation effect. And that can be also added uh, to this solution. And you, you put a uh, Keplerian type solution, then you have a secular evolution of the conserved quantities. And if you put, combine them together, actually you can follow the uh, orbit for a long time. And so Keplerian parameterization means that if in purely Keplerian system, you have this kind of equation. Uh, the U is eccentric anomaly. And uh, instead of uh, A and E, you have uh, this ER, uh, which is one of the uh, eccentricity parameters. So you have uh, more than one eccentricity. So for the mean motion, uh, you have another eccentricity. And you have the expressions for the, these quantities. It's a bit lengthy, but uh, it's much more compact than the uh, post-Newtonian. And uh, so quasi-Keplerian parameters such as AR, ER, and AI are functions of conserved quantities. Uh, such parameter solutions have been obtained to up to 3 pn order uh, by my student very recently for non-spinning binaries. And uh, he has already finished the 4 pn order. Uh, so uh, in fact, it's up to 3 pn. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the orbit in elliptical orbit has been uh, done some time ago, but we have extended to this hyperbolic orbit. And uh, 4 pn is the very late, latest one. And gravitational wave emission is that the, uh, first of all, the Keplerian parameterization ignores the effects of the gravitational waves. And gravitational wave of, uh, emission appears from 2.5 pn order. And 3 pn is already inconsistent with this. And, but uh, gravitational waves from binaries in non-circular motion can be computed using the Kaurapula approximation. Of course, you can, you can go into the higher order mode. It's a bit more uh, complicated. But just uh, concentrating on Kaurapula approximation, uh, then uh, th these are uh, expressed in terms of these quantities uh, for a given binary. This is a non-spinning binary because we have uh, th th that lies on the plane. And uh, then uh, gravitational wave back re reaction causes Keplerian parameters to vary. And uh, in particular, these, these numbers are sufficient to characterize the evolution. And if you combine uh, this par parametric Keplerian parameterization with the secular evolution, then you have a full evolution up to, uh, the, this has been done up to uh, 3.5 pn order. And so we, we have a 3.5 pn accurate uh, temporal evolution and uh, also the waveforms, et cetera. So these, these are the examples of, of this kind of studies. And you see that uh, this, 3.5 pn orbital evolution compared to the uh, Newtonian. And uh, at far distances, they are the same, but uh, at near the, near the pericenter, there's a big difference. And th these are the uh, waveforms, and uh, the 3.5 waveforms. And this is uh, just Newtonian waveform, uh, assuming 2.5 pn formula. Uh, and this is another example. So uh, I haven't shown here, but we also uh, compared this with the numerical uh, calculation. And this is quite consistent with the numerical calculation. And uh, maybe I can just skip here uh, parabolic approximation and just uh, the, if you want to ge generate uh, wave waveforms, maybe it's easier to use parab parabolic approximation because it requires uh, to specify a smaller number of parameters. Uh, I just want to show that the, this uh, parabolic approximation gives you a very good uh, result. If you, uh, if you have a parabolic orbit with the same uh, pericenter distance for moderately eccentric uh, ones. But if, if the eccentricity deviates from one very much, then of course uh, the deviation is large. 
But in, in many cases, actually, the, in terms of eccentricity, uh, I think you don't expect too much deviation from, from one in most of the encounters. Now, uh, if you have a capture, then uh, gravitational waveforms are complex and contain many uh, rich features. These are not the real uh, 3.5 calculation, but uh, uh, kind of Newtonian calculation. I want to just point out the uh, interesting features. You have this burst-like emissions many, many times. Uh, this is a particular choice of the centricity uh, in, uh, in units of days, but in cases, in some cases, in, uh, they are separated by the years. And uh, then you run into this kind of densely dense phases. But still, uh, at this phase, the typical frequency of the gravitational wave is, is very, very low. You can just assume that it's the inverse of this number. Uh, so it means that millihertz, uh, et cetera. Uh, and then, so this is a low, regarded as a low frequency source. And at the end, you have a high frequency source. So you, you, you can detect this individual burst from with the high frequency detector because individual peaks, uh, duration of individual peak peaks are very short. But uh, as it's circularized that the, uh, actually you have a relatively low frequency continuous wave, then at the end you have a burst-like uh, wave at high frequency again. So there could be a rich kind of uh, features out of the, uh, the capture. And uh, so we uh, try to see how far you can see uh, for different masses, et cetera. And this is one example that the, with the advanced LIGO and, uh, and so on, uh, actually the, the horizon, horizon distance is uh, not that large. Uh, this is uh, 10 megaparsec, 100 megaparsec, and this is gigaparsec. So even with the uh, Einstein telescope that is planned uh, in Europe, uh, maybe next decade, uh, you cannot go beyond uh, several hundred megaparsec. You can uh, understand this because this is due to distant encounters, and they don't produce very strong uh, signal. But uh, and another important thing is that higher mass black holes may produce stronger signal, but they their uh, their peaks the widths widths are longer, and therefore they cannot be easily detected by the ground-based detector. So there's an optical optimal range of the mass, which is around. 10 and 20 solar mass for the, uh, uh, for the ground-based detectors. So that's uh, something we are working on. And I don't, as I said, I may not be able to do this uh, here, so I just skip this part, except that we are working on the concept of the gravitational wave detector, which is sensitive in this uh, range uh, where the both LISA and other detectors are not so sensitive. So if you have uh, any detector uh, good in this range, uh, they can be used for the high mass black holes. But one another uh, interesting thing you can do is that the actually you can localize these sources uh, to a very high accuracy. Uh, because if you can observe this for a long time, you have modulations of the signal due to the different configuration of detector relative to the, to the uh, source. Uh, and then uh, you have Doppler motion because of the, uh, the uh, Earth moves around the sun. And combining these things, you can reach maybe even uh, less than one square degree and 0.1 square degree, where maybe there are a smaller number of galaxies. So just summarize, uh, black holes observed by LIGO so far uh, show somewhat unexpected results masses and uh, effective spin. I didn't talk about spin uh, in spin here. And the origin of this uh, remain, remains to be understood. And hyperbolic encounters uh, may be interesting thing uh, that you can study further uh, because of the reasons I have described. And maybe while you are uh, thinking about the questions, I'll just show the on video, advertisement of the next IA General Assembly to be held in Korea in 2021.
It's only two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> So I think the uh, important thing is this in 2021 in August. <laughs> Thank right. you very much. <laughs>